Hi, thank yeah. you very much yeah. uh, for staying with us uh, uh, during this uh, hefty morning. And we have the before lunch talk. It's always the one with, uh, you can see the hungry faces of the crowd. Uh, but we're still hungry a bit for some blockchain. I think I'll, I'll let uh, each of our uh, speakers to have a chance to introduce themselves. Uh, maybe we'll start, uh, yeah, Bas, you already had a chance to introduce yourself before. Uh, Michael, would you be the first one to introduce yourself and also the company you're currently representing? Sure. Uh, so my name is Michael Hood. I'm a professor at Imperial College London, but I'm also CTO of a startup headquartered in Berlin, uh, Xane. So I'll talk a bit more about that in the afternoon. And so I'm, I'm kind of in the, you know, finance. I'm also co-lead of a fintech network at Imperial, so I have a bit of a, a osmosis in that sort of world, but I'm mostly in cybersecurity and trust management. That's my expertise. And your company also deals with real-time Real application. That's right. So, so I'll, I'll talk about that in the afternoon. Fantastic. Uh, Gary? Right. Um, I'm Grigore Roshu. I'm also a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and I also founded the company Runtime Verification. Um, and my research and my group's research and my company's research is all about uh, formal methods applied in uh, programming languages, software engineering. Um, and generally, we try to make sure the programs do what they are supposed to do. Yes, uh, I'm from the same field, actually. Uh, I'm from programming languages, specifically static analysis, formal verification. I worked in Tel Aviv University, but now we have a young company, which I'll be talking this afternoon, which are interested in formally verifying and proving, uh, uh, finding bugs in smart contracts. Yeah, great. So first I'll have a, a, a question, mainly for three out of the four of you that have an extensive uh, knowledge in terms of formal verification. And maybe to help some of the crowd, maybe you can explain in simple terms uh, what is it and why your specific uh, project work is important. What is formal verification? What is formal verification? So you have a program, and uh, that program may do bad things, not because uh, um, those bad things were intended, but maybe they were intended too. So how can you guarantee that the program does what it's supposed to do? So uh, to do that, we typically need to create a model, a mathematical model, of the program, and sometimes we create that model automatically from a model of the programming language. But the point is that we need a model, and from that we need to extract the mathematical behavior of the program, and then to use mathematical tools and reasoning to verify the program, basically to make sure that the program does only what it is supposed to do. And one particular aspect which is extremely important is that of um, specification of properties. Um, in our experience in my company and in my research, um, writing down the formal specifications, uh, basically the formal, formalize the properties that program are supposed to obey, it is often the case um, that it is much harder than actually verifying the program. I agree, totally agree. So let me second you. Uh, the, the specification is a one of so. If you think of one, one way to view formal verification is kind of automatic QA. So what the QA do for you, they usually like look into your program and they find bugs. Or, or maybe they show that they are not there. And formal verification is trying to do it more in a mathematical sense. But the, the, the biggest challenge is sort of understanding what the program is supposed to do. And this is actually what many companies, including us, including Grand Verification, are doing. We are actually talking to the customer and trying to understand what are you actually trying to implement. And then we are developing a mathematical model that emulates the program, and then we compare the mathematical model to the desired behavior. And we either show you some things that are correct, or actually find some deviation from the, from the specification. So, uh, there, there are various aspects about formal verification. It's also uh, different people mean different things. When they say formal verification, there's a, there's a spectrum from just writing down on paper what is supposed to happen to a very detailed verification where you have a proof assistant with a very small core and there's a very high uh, standard of, of verification. What's different in our project from some of the other uh, companies doing it, we, we're in the luxury position that we can actually design the, the smart contract language ourselves and we're, we've chosen a, a functional smart contract language so it's a whole class of bugs that doesn't show up and, and we've done the same thing as what Cardano has been doing and what Tezos has been doing. So you, you see a shift in the third generation of blockchains towards 
smart contract languages with a functional core. So there's a lot of bug finding you don't need to do anymore. And then there's still a lot of work to be done to actually specify what a program is supposed to do. And what we want to, ha want to have done is to have the whole uh, uh, implementation check uh, stack of the blockchain to be verified. So consensus protocol, the execution layer, the smart contract uh, languages, we want to prove all kinds of things about the languages. And then about, about the, individual, uh, the individual contexts themselves. And there have been horrible accidents on the blockchain already. And this is an area where formal verification is crucial because these errors show up in uh, programs about a thousand line of code, but you lose something like 50 million euros uh, by bugs in those, uh, those contracts. So this is for people coming from formal verification, this is an ideal place where our methods actually, so, so this is what has been waiting for us uh, where we can make our methods uh, effective. Yes, so as uh, Bas mentioned, uh, there are a couple of famous uh, cases of uh, being rubbed on a blockchain <laughs> in simple terms. I mean, from the DAO hack, which is, might have been the early one, that led to the, to the hard fork of uh, Ethereum, to more recently with uh, Parity uh, and others. Uh, but uh, you mentioned, how do you find this uh, specification that you mentioned, and uh, in terms of what is it that we should formally verify? And even if you take it a step forward, if you have of course, you cannot formally verify everything. So how can you ever be happy in a world like that? And again, taking into the context of we are part of a fintech, and eventually in fintech, like Silvia mentioned earlier, it's billions going to be mentioned on it. How can we ever be happy? And please, Michael. Yes, I, I could maybe say a few things about this. I mean, I actually started a career in formal verification, so I, I kind of know that world quite well. Yeah? But, but from a business perspective, I think this is exactly the point. You know? so, it might make sense to take a core piece and do a, a huge effort in terms of money to formally verify this, like the uh, microcontroller that they did in Australia yeah, for, for certain applications. However, this doesn't really scale for mainstream programming and so on, right? So, so I think here we need to have a way of looking at these uh, formal methods contributions within a risk management context of my product, right? So I have to be able to decide where is it most critical for me to actually invest this kind of money and those resources to, to put this there? Yeah. And so clearly, you know, if I have a, a layer one, like uh, Sylvia was saying about atomic swaps, I want to make uh, very, very sure that this is, is going to work, yeah? because this is where the, 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 the ground jewels are going to sit. Yeah? Whereas if I had some more mundane thing on my fringe, uh, I can assess the impact of this going wrong, and if that's below a certain threshold from my business development point of view, I'm not going to do formal methods. So just to, to clarify, I think you, you're absolutely right that, formal verifi that functional programming allows you to avoid some bugs. In fact, we use formal verification in our tools, but even with, formal, with functional languages, you, at the end of the day, the DAO bug, actually, we can prove it in, that it doesn't exist in, in, a, in an imperative language and we can prove it exists in a functional language. So at the end of the day, if you are working in a Turing complete language and you are working even in a language like ML, you can have severe bugs. And in fact, the, 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 proving the absence of bug or, or finding them could be equally hard in imperative or functional. It's true that in a functional programming, perhaps if you have good discipline, you avoid them. But from a formal verification perspective, when we have customers and they have tokens and they have to make sure it's correct and they ask us if we move to the functional programming, will it, will it still it exist? And the answer is yes, it will exist. And people make mistakes and people, I, we can show you in, a, in the afternoon, I'll show you mistakes that actually people in, in, with PhD in computer science are making in this space. And if they move, and they are actually, they are Haskell programmers, by the way. It's not an issue of what, I mean, it's Haskell programmers are probably better programmers for to speak, to speak. but they make mistakes as well. And, and, and we are trying to avoid mistakes, and we're trying to avoid mistakes with bad consequences. There were, this is where specification comes into play. Uh, so it's true, you're pushing functional programming, but even in Solidity, you can write a decent program. It's true that Solidity is perhaps a bad language, but you can write a pretty de decent program in it. And even in ML, you can write a terrible program, and I have, d I have done that. <laughs> <Me> so, <too. laughs>
No, actually, it's a follow-up. So Greg, are you? Uh, uh, so I, d I don't know whether you were talking to me or to <laughs> to, to you. To you. Okay. So so. Sorry for not uh, being. Not, not to me. <laughs> Uh, so, so my background is in is, 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 is no 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 my my background is in formal verification. I've I've you written huge uh, developments in the, the Cox theorem prover. Uh, I was just saying that in in our project and in the Tesos and the Cardano project, we we have had this luxury to be able to design our smart contract language. So there's a lot of things we don't need to check anymore. Of course, there's still an awful lot that we still need to prove, and, and I'll I'll speak about this in the afternoon. Uh, Gregor, you also so, um, yeah, you asked when are you happy with the specification? And also so we are happy when the customer is happy. Uh, <laughs> so we answer. have lots of, as, as, as Moni said, we have uh, lots of discussions with the customers trying to figure out what they had in mind when they wrote the code. They typically have a page or two of uh, English, uh, and they think that everything is crystal clear there. But then as we start asking questions, we realize that things are not that clear. For example, what happens if you transfer money from yourself to yourself? And we found bugs in such situations. They said, why would you transfer money from yourself to yourself? Because I can. And if I can print money that way, I will do it. Yeah. Um, so you have to actually look at all these corner cases. And, um, and, um, and uh, we pretty much separate the formal verification process in two steps, where the first one is to agree on the specifications, um, even informally, but informally but kind of formal specifications without showing them our formalism but to understand that that's what they wanted and then we write those specifications down and that takes us more than half the time actually to do the formal verification and then we verify everything we don't need a customer when we start verifying but we need a customer to make sure that we capture the properties they had in mind and during the process what is really valuable to many of our customers is that all the assumptions on which the correctness of their programs is based, become explicit. So we show them there are all these 22 assumptions. Did you know about that? All these are needed. Uh, with one customer, we even had to go down to the axiom of choice in set <laughs> theory. They had a set, and that set had to be totally ordered. And uh, that's not for granted. Um, when you go down to the axioms of mathematics to do verification, you need to worry about all the details. Only? Yeah, so actually I, I agree with Gregory. The only difference between us is that we do the same, but we let the customer do the work. <laughs> so the idea is, for example, we have a company called Compound Finance, which is actually pretty big in this space. So when we started, we do the same. They send us the thing, and we had like uh, people, including uh, David Deal from Stanford, and other, we wrote the spec for them. And we said, no, that's not the way. They have to write the spec. And in V2, they wrote the spec. And it's actually a very interesting experience in this space because we are trying to push this paradigm. They usually, in this thing, people say code is the law. We are trying to move the paradigm, say spec is the law. So we are then trying to make people write comprehensive spec. In fact, with Compound, we have incredible experience. We have showed this afternoon. We're actually exactly the same of bug that the Gogori was saying. We found to the customer after they wrote the spec. And the nice thing about spec, yes, they, are, they take some time to write, but they, they write it for, for version 2, and they will, be, they will survive for version 3 and other versions. So the code will change a lot, but the spec change, changes less frequently. So it is true, it's expensive to build the spec. Another thing which is nice about the spec, we are now engaging with other customers, and we are finding out, in fact, we can use the same spec. So we are telling our customer, you know, instead of you paying us, maybe we will pay you. So the idea is that now, if you contribute a spec that we will use, we will find a way via token or via other way to give you, because we have, we are, we are trying, by the way, desperately to hire people, so if you have, but it's very difficult for us to get enough people who, who know how to write a spec. But interestingly, in this space, we are finding more and more people who are willing to write spec. And yes, occasionally they write wrong spec and we review that. But they actually understand this space very well. I show you this afternoon that they came with, with specs, which are, I think they are interesting in, in the sense that they, they actually represent interesting facts about the space of, of cryptocurrency. So we, we heard about atomic spark, but they're actually more interesting things that we can come up. And once you have these specs, you can check them. So we are actually thinking, and we, we, one of the things that we are contrib contributing is a spec language, which emulating things like even going back to VDM, which was invent invented in Denmark. But it's this idea that we can have now the spec that people write, uh, people, pe people, engineers can write their spec, not us, so, hopefully. Yeah. 
Thanks, Molly. I'll give you a public address if you want to contribute to, to my private one. <laughs> uh, but back to you, Michael, uh, from an application point of view, because it sounds almost grim discussion a little bit about how difficult it's actually uh, to work on the blockchain. What is your experience on the other side? And how do you think, can we actually expect adoption from a practical? Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, in a way, so I have some experience in like automotive and IoT mobility and so on with real clients. Um, and there it's a bit tricky because, you know, if you work, say, with an innovation department, this is more sort of a PR exercise. They have the separate sort of budgets, you know, so they just want to play with these things, understand them, and maybe then project them for their PR. Uh, that's maybe not too interesting. Uh, it's a different story when you move into sort of serious production kind of thinking, yeah, and then... Uh, scalability is one of the, the things. And I would also say just the whole maturity of the technology. Yeah? So if you're, for example, imagining you might put up a decentralized infrastructure for a, a few hundred thousand cars. Yeah? So this is not something that I could actually say, oh, I have something off the shelf, you know, whether some blockchain product, I can actually reliably put this to you into my uh, business proposal and, and off we go. Yeah? So we're just not quite there yet. And I think this is really one of the issues in trying to really bring this in. So you can do proofs of concepts and so on, but once you start talking production, you're also hitting the sort of regulatory and, and other sort of domain-specific things, like say in automotive, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of bells and whistles around these things where this beautiful tech we also saw in this morning isn't sort of fitting like a glove exactly, to put it mildly. Yeah? So I think those are some of the, the challenges we're facing at the moment. Uh, excellent point. I actually thought about it this morning. We had the AI discussion. And I remember one of the participants said that he's no longer doing proof of concept because he got sick of it because uh, he expects the technology to be more mature. And I was thinking we're actually five or seven years behind them at least and we are in the POC stake often. Uh, but it, but uh, actually to connect this too, I think still with all of this reservation in mind, I think there are about half a billion funds sitting in DeFi application. You mentioned Compound before that I think hold 20 to 30 million. I think the same sit for Dharma and I think MakerDAO holding north to $400 million. And I'm thinking as a user, point of view, from a protocol upgrade. So actually in my second half, the far part of the deco part, we're sitting at eToro and we love to fund such companies and collaborate with them. And we want to offer our customer the possibility to get the compound interest over the returns. But how can we feel comfortably, and I want to ask it for all of you, how can I, we feel comfortably if they upgrade their protocol uh, and holding tens of millions of customers' money, uh, they sign to your sys, but how can we feel comfortable with that? And maybe how your technologies can make us feel more comfortable with that. I think we're actually much ahead of AI. So in the blockchain space, we actually know what we're doing. We have mathematical proofs of most of the things, most of the technologies that are in there. <laughs> Whereas in, in AI, um, they put something in a neural net and then something comes out depending on the data. And we've, we've had a number of discussions this morning about accidents happening there. So there things are a lot uh, also, the quality of programming languages that we're using in the blockchain space is much higher than what they, they're using in AI. So I, I actually think we're ahead in that respect. Fantastic. So uh, actually, the, for us, uh, I, I should acknowledge, there are, there are tricky parts about the technology, but most of the technology that we are doing now is based on open source, which was provided by uh, Microsoft and others. It's not perfect, but it is working kind of okay. The, the biggest problem for us is the specs. The problem is that if we didn't get the right specs and it did occur for us, then it's a problem. And we are trying to find ways around it. We are thinking of solutions somehow, check the specs. But we, all we are telling our customer that we are improving the situation. And also eventually, even if it turns out, for example, we have check the code and after we have checked the spec we have asked a hacker and the hacker, hacker found a problem in the code and this was actually a, a bug in the spec so the spec missed the point so we we if the spec is is partial and if the spec doesn't cover the situation we are in fact and this is a case which we need help actually i think the analogy to ai is beautiful i mean uh, being old enough i sort of had many friends that went to google and talking to Hector Garcia a lot. In fact, the, the way Google, when Google started, it has also a lot of manual aspect. So for us, in formal verification, the biggest manual effort is the specs. If we find a way, and we, we are researchers, it's not that I have any solution here, but if we have find a way to, 
to take Gregorius back and to take something and to understand it and maybe make them more reusable, then maybe in the, in the, in the end it will be actually more mature. That's, that's the hope. I, I fully agree, specs. <laughs> and um, and um, no matter what formalism used for the specs, they are all rigorous. Ultimately, you can translate from one to another. Um, even protocols, you mentioned the protocols, uh, you update the protocol. The protocols themselves have specs and they have proofs of correctness themselves. And uh, if you update the protocol as far as it satisfies the spec, then, uh, then uh, it's a correct implementation of the, of the, of the uh, protocol. And then uh, the layer above, uh, programs um, or uh, swaps or what others, they, they rely on the properties of the protocol. You have this nice separation. So yeah, I agree, we are in a better shape than uh, the AI. Uh, because everything can be rigorously defined mathematically and we can reason about um, everything. But I won't let you off the hook so easily. Uh, because no, it's not easy. I'm not, no. I'm not trying to make it easy. I, 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 I don't mean it's easily. I mean so getting off I the hook it is easy. possible. It is possible to do it. It is possible, but let's look at a and comparison. And it's, in, it's in within reach as well. We have the tools. Um, so we're talking about on-chain in a fully, hopefully, or semi-fully decentralized network, we're holding serious funds, right? If an AI is used, even if it's less rigorous, if AI is used within a centralized mechanism, say a banking sector, um, and a mistake is happening there, maybe the severity of that mistake is less severe <laughs> than what happened in a fully decentralized way, you cannot revert it. So even though the technology is more, it's the same as if we look at, and I think that's also a good comparison to formal verification again, if we have to send uh, a satellite to space and, you know, to go and visit Neptune and we made a mistake, you know, that's a, that's a big mistake. <laughs> if we make a mistake in uh, the user interface of some web page, you know, maybe they would live with it. And I think people see money fairly serious. And, uh, you know, if we take half a billion dollars, I mean, it's serious funding for everybody. And, you know, people put the money in the bank because they, I mean, they don't love it, but they feel it's secure there. They feel, okay, it's, it's better than put it underneath uh, the floor, right? And how do we actually been able to achieve that within a technology? And back to your spec uh, argument. So my spec is very simple. Don't lose my money. Everything else is optional. So Can we achieve it today? So that's actually and, very... Uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry, so I just wanted to say something about finance. It's really about people. You know, there's a couple of millennia of history how we sort of, uh, you know, had this emerging way of understanding how we transact and, and the contract law around this. So, so I think there's a real opportunity here for, for the formal methods people to go yet another level of abstraction higher yeah, and actually find those languages that are going to be closer to the actual contract laws and, and then to, you know, to explore the gaps in these abstraction layers for the runtime things where you do the specs for, for the runnable things, right? So I think that's where the tension is, but that's also where the real opportunity is, you know, to, to get that. So when you were saying earlier about, oh, what if the protocol gets updated? Well, I as a consumer would just say, hey, that's just a clause in my contract. I expect this X, Y, Z. I don't care about these operational details, right? So, so this is really the kind of challenge that we also have to, to address uh, as, as uh, technologists. Yeah, so one of the beautiful things about specs, which actually I came to realize this company, is that actually it could be partial and useful. So the idea is that sometimes, in fact, the, the property that you care, you told me about, it's actually I can find many bugs on it and I can prove it. Or the property that says the bank has at least a third of the money available, it's something that we can specify and check for. So the idea is that the spec need not be complete. Gregorio said that some specification, you need the axiom of choice. But the interesting, even with partial spec, you can get pretty far. So, so, the, so full spec, of course, are, are lovely, but uh, sometimes even partial spec could be very, very useful in this space. So it can, and in fact, you are, you are, you are comparing to AI, but in AI we don't have some kind of guarantees. Like in fact, people are, and this is a case with informal method. We can come with some kind of a, give you a, a sort of assurance, and this assurance can, can we can allow you to program in in, in a language like C or Java, or Camel, or Haskell. It doesn't matter. We'll give you certain assurance that you care about. I have many more questions, but maybe someone from the audience wants to also participate. Uh, we are open for audience questions. If you want to think about it, we'll continue in the meanwhile, but... Uh... So maybe I can remark to what uh, uh, Michael, Michael has said before. Um, so so the, the size of a, a blockchain implementation, it, it's not so, uh, so big actually compared to, to other projects. So you compared it to, for instance, the verification of a micro, microkernel that, that has been done. Um, 
and, and there's still work continuing in that direction. It, it's certainly within that realm. Uh, in my talk later this afternoon, I'll compare it to the, uh, the implementation of TLS, which has been ver completely verified. Of course, there's, this is what you've been saying. This really depends on the spec, but there's been a very reasonable spec for TLS, and it has been proved to satisfy that specification. And that's certainly a standard of rigor that, that's within reach for blockchain. And if we're building a bridge, and, and here we're actually building, I mean, this is what um, uh, Silvio had in, at the last slide. So if we now want to build a bridge like this, there would be all kinds of regulations for the quality that the bridge doesn't collapse. If we spend a similar amount of effort and money on sticking to these regulations, but then do it for software, we could actually have a formally verified blockchain. Oh, fantastic. Uh, maybe a less common or less words for some of the speakers. Uh, most important problems in your opinion currently or challenges? I think people in the blockchain space should be aware of the fact that formal analysis, formal verification of programs is a very expensive process. Um, before UIUC, I was, a, I was a research scientist at NASA, and the rule of thumb there was that 80% uh, of the resources of a project go into validation and verification, and only 20% in writing the code. Many of the customers we work with come to us after they work like half a year to write a contract, and they say, you know what, can you verify this for us in one week? <laughs> and they also don't want to pay much. So uh, I think until people you know, have this mental shift and understand that formal verification is a very rigorous and very intensive process. Um, people will just not do it. I also and just want to quickly say, I mean, I think as researchers, we have to do a better job in unifying language and terminology in this space when we talk to people in commercials. So I've had some anecdotes I can't quite share in, in full form that were basically bizarre, you know, where uh, someone might say, oh, blockchain, we need to do blockchain. And then someone else in a company might come up, oh, we have distributed ledgers, maybe we should do that, you know. And, and then if you probe this, you might discover that other thing doesn't even have consensus. Yeah? So there's just a, a complete lack of understanding of what the potential of this technology is. People are kind of interested, but not having this clarity in the first conversation is basically a hindrance to, to the adoption of the technology. Yeah, uh, I can say that for me, the biggest fun part about working in this space, apart from the fact that I find it to be you know, the biggest transformation, and I think that was also mentioned by, by Silvio, I, I find the most interesting one is by transforming the current markets, you know, not the current 200 billion markets blockchain world, but the, you know, $300 trillion market and move it to be completely decentralized. But the fact that both academia and the industry are really combined in a very nice way, and the, actually a lot of the work we're doing in the industry is very research to us, and I'm sure that's why there are a lot of us which are doing both things together. Uh, and I'm really looking forward for your conversation this afternoon to really learn more in details about your case studies and maybe you give a hand for the speakers. And <laughs>